Hi my name is Matt, welcome back to the shop and today is a follow up video for someone that asked me a question and I do apologise, I can't remember your name, I've got loads of stuff to do but there's a video for you just for the sake of it. So this person asked a question which was quite a good question and I see his point, I have a series on how gearboxes work, here's video 1, 2 and 3, the first video is about how the actual selector mechanism works i.e. how the gears move in relationship to each other. The second video here is about the actual selector fork mechanism, i.e. how the actual selector fork rotates the channels and the selector fork forks, um, how they intersect with the gears and make everything move. And then the third video is the actual mechanism with the pause and how it knows to rotate to first and second and so on and so forth. Um, they were quite in-depth videos and the uh, commenter did say that he, I think what he was trying to say was that he was actually just basically confused about the actual gearbox as a whole, not how in each individual thing moves and what have you, but how gears work, um, not just that they turn, but how the ratios and stuff uh, change the speed from a constant speed um, from your engine or a constant speed range from your engine is then put into a gearbox and you get different outputs which is a good point so we're going to go to the board and I'm going to explain just so I've covered it the very very basics of gears and then we're going to come back here and actually have a look about how all this mechanism works right then so we're going to look at the gear relationship between weirdly enough gears so the best way to think of gears is just forget the teeth and just look at two spinning discs. So if you have one spinning disc and another spinning disc and they are the same size this is one to one ratio which means that if you spin this gear this way this gear will spin counterclockwise because the two mating surfaces are coming into each other and feeding back out you know so it's got this motion and they rub against each other just like the wheels and the road. If you have two gears of equal size if you do 1000 RPM into this gear, you're going to get 1000 RPM back out. Gears do not work singularly, they have to be a pair. They have to have something to mesh into, otherwise, nothing's, and that's a bloody bloodstain, <laughs> nothing's going to happen if there's just one gear on its own. It's just going to be a pretty spinning gear. If we have a different ratio, so this gear is. A, that's how big it is, and this gear is a oh, two a. It's twice the size. What happens is, is if you put a thousand RPM into here, then you're going to get five hundred RPM out of here. The reason why is if you think that this is our starting point, the circumference around this gear, the distance all the way around, just say at uh, the bleh, the circumference of this gear all the way around will just say is 10. Now the distance all the way around this gear will just say is 20. Well it actually is 20, that's a very important thing. If this is 10 and this is twice the size then the circumference is 20. It's as simple as that. So if we rotate this all the way around to there then we've travelled 10 units but if we travel 10 units we're going to end up here which is half the distance which means that we have to go around twice for this to cover one complete distance. Now the same can be said for the other way around. If this is the input, this is the driving gear and this is the driven gear but I don't want to get into that because that, when you're first learning this that is really complicated. Well, not really but it can be complicated. So we'll just say this is the input and this is the output. As we had before with our distances of 10 circumference and a 20 circumference, if we go all the way around here to a full 20 units, this has to go around twice because 10 divides into there's two tens in 20, so you go around and round all again. So if we're going 100 a thousand rpm in this gear, this gear is now going 2,000 rpm. You see the relationship. So we can do two things with gears. The two things we can do with gears is we can we can increase speed or we can increase torque. 
and they are interchangeable with each other. So if you want more speed, you have to sacrifice some of your torque for that speed. If you want more torque, you have to sacrifice speed for torque. It is a fundamental thing. It's actually ge it's ge geometry. There's nothing we can do to get around that. That is just the way the universe is. So if you, want, if you have an input gear and you want to go slower, then you have a bigger gear. Because this one has a unit of 10, if we go around all the way around once, this has gone around half the time, so this has got a circumference of 20, but it also means that our speed is halved. If you want to go 1000 RPM with this gear, when you get to this gear it's 500 RPM. It has to travel twice as far to do the same, and your driving gear, your input, is always the leader in how much speed you have. Is if this is a thousand RPM and this is 500 RPM, we've lost speed. But what I said before is we want to increase torque. So if you measure this diameter radius from here and we've got a force of n on this, our newton meters of torque, and we say this is a hundred newton meters of torque that's been applied to this gear at a thousand RPM, but we'll forget that for a minute, then as soon as you put the torque through this at this speed, what you're going to get out of here is 200 newton meters. You are going to effectively double. And the reason being is, is that torque is around a pivotal, around a, an axis. It is a force applied perpendicular to this axis. And if you look here, the gear teeth that are coming around are doing the same thing. They are applying a force perpendicular to the rotational axis. So whatever torque is at this outer circumference is going to be at the outer circumference of this disc. However, the reason why it's a torque multiplication is because the distance from the centre is greater. So, you know, torque is your force times by your um, distance from your centre, your lever. So if we have a bigger lever, especially a lever that's twice the size, then we are going to have twice the torque. So that's, this is a case of increasing torque by stealing speed. So we're back from the board and now we have a basic understanding of how gears actually transmit speed versus torque and backwards and forwards and so on. When we actually look at a gearbox you need to kind of forget that all these other gears here are here. It's just the gears that are in play and I'll explain that in a second. But there is a um, motion path if you want to think about it like that. So the motion path is always going from the input into the shaft. It's transferred by a pair of gears and then to the output shaft. That is basically just it. Now when you do engine braking and stuff, yes that does come into it, but that's not that's um, too much for this video. This is quite a simplistic video. Right, so like I said before, we have to follow the, the, the motion path that goes through the gearbox. So as you can see on here, I've got a bit of fag paper with a bit of red on it to mark it out so we can see that turn or not turn. And if we hold this shaft, so that's the resistance from the rear wheel, and I turn the input shaft, you can see that there are one, two, three, four pairs of gears rotating. However, the input, the output shaft isn't moving, so the engine is now in neutral. Uh, the gearbox sorry, is in neutral. So the engine's ticking away, you let your clutch out, so the engine is turning the entire gearbox but under no load, nothing's happening. The gears are just spinning and we're staying still. So you disengage the engine by pulling in your clutch which means that this stops turning or it, it starts to slow down and you then click down and you select first. So what happens when we select first? So this is the first gear here on the input shaft. This is first gear on the output shaft. And to select that gear, this gear is a freewheeling gear. Look, it just spins independent of the output shaft. So what we need to do is we need to lock this gear to this shaft. So power comes in through this shaft to this gear, and all the others. Uh, power is then transferred to this gear, and as you can see, nothing happens. But 
this movable gear here is locked to the shaft. If I turn this shaft you can see that this one turns and is locked to the shaft. So what we do is we move this gear so the dogs engage first gear. So power is now going in the input shaft into first gear, into its mated gear pair, first gear on the output shaft. This gear is then, as this gear turns, it transfers its power to this gear because it does it through the dogs, they are now solidly linked, that's it, and then this gear transfers it to the actual shaft. Now you might think, well this gear and this gear are now touching, but this gear is a freewheeling gear. You see, I can move that with the shaft and nothing happens. So now when we turn, you can see I have to put a lot of turns in to rotate. God, it's taking quite a long time. So if we go for rotation, so that's zero, so we'll say there, it's half a turn, half a turn again, half a turn again, and half a turn again. So that's two full turns, pretty much for one rotation there. So as you can see, just by selecting this, if we deselect, if we unselect that gear, and then we select another gear, and so on and so forth. So the small, the largest gear on the input shaft, which is this gear here, this is sixth gear, which means that this gear here is sixth gear. So how do we lock this shaft? Well, this gear here is a freewheeling gear. But as you noticed, this gear here isn't a freewheeling gear. As I turn this, the entire shaft, even though we're in neutral, even though we're in neutral, if I turn this gear, the shaft rotates. So what we need to do is we need to lock this gear. And this movable gear is the one that does that job. The dogs lock in position. And the beautiful thing about this is you can see the dogs in this example. So you can see that as I hold this gear, see that? That's the dogs locking into position. And as I turn this now, we're now in 6 gear. If I try and hold this, yeah, there's resistance. So now if we start from here again and watch how many turns this takes, that's half a turn, well that's, that's 3 quarters of a turn and we've got 1 turn here. So it's 3 quarters, say, and 1 turn. So you can see how the gear relationship changes as you select each individual gear, like I showed you on the board. If you have different relationships between gears, then you are going to get a different output speed, be it slower or faster. Right, I hope that cleared that up. If you uh, have any questions, please leave them in the comments. I am happy to answer them. Um, it isn't rocket science, but I'm also not a professor, so sometimes my teaching methods are the best. And if you see something that could be done in a better way, please leave a comment. I don't take it personally. You know, I am trying to teach people this stuff. If I haven't got the message across properly in the first time, then I need to try again. Right then, I'll see you in a bit.